Hello and welcome to this introduction to the evolution video. I'm Dr. Alad Roberts and in this video we're going to look at and consider various pieces of evidence for evolution and how this evidence has helped shape our understanding. Now evolution is a biological process by which living organisms change and adapt to their surroundings over time. And because the earth has a vast range of different habitats, evolution has led to the rich diversity of life we see today. But what evidence is there to actually support this theory? Well, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence from a broad range of sources. And while some people who are critical of evolution try to dispute some of this evidence, when we take a holistic approach using all of the information that we've gathered over the past 150 years, and don't cherry pick, we generate a compelling argument in favour of evolution that is quite hard to dispute, although some do try. Now some of the key observations we have used to document evolution and identify the mechanism is through the use of five key evidence types. Anatomical features of different species, molecular biology and genetic information, biogeography and the distribution of species, fossil records and direct observations of living species. And we'll go through each of these in turn to see how they have helped shape our understanding of evolution. So first up we have fossils, which act as a sort of window to the past, providing a record of species that wandered the earth long before we did. Now these are extremely helpful because we could compare fossil records and by extension compare ancient species and hypothesise how they changed over time, when they might have become extinct and how different species might have developed from them. Now our fossil records can actually be subdivided into two main types. First, we have our fossils, which are essentially preserved remains of a dead organism, and these are what we dig out of sedimentary rock layers around the world. We then have what we call subfossils, which are a piece of a dead organism, usually bones that have been preserved through time, but has not completed the entire fossilization process, either because the conditions aren't supportive or not enough time has passed. And one of the key ways in which we can distinguish between a fossil and a subfossil is that a fossil contains no DNA, whereas trace amounts of DNA can be found within our subfossil, as there is still some level of organic material left behind. Now we can actually use these different types of fossils as evidence for evolution, as they help to show which species have become extinct, the potential origins of new species, and evolutionary changes in groups of organisms over time. So if we were to look at an example, evolution of the modern horse took around 57 million years as various aspects changed. Some of the oldest horse records relate to Mesohippus, which was fox-like in size, their feet had four long toes, and they had teeth capable of eating soft leaves. Then as we went through evolutionary history, horses became taller to help spotting predators, Multiple toes changed into a single hoof to aid running and allow them to escape predators, and their teeth became stronger to help them grind grass and seeds more effectively without wearing the teeth out. And this evolutionary process has continued until we ended up with what we call today the modern horse from the Equus genus. Now moving on, our next piece of evidence is based on the anatomy of different species and how some species share physical features as a result of shared ancestry. Now these different anatomical features or structures can be either homologous or analogous. Essentially homologous features, in the context of anatomy at least, are anatomical features that appear similar in different organisms because they were inherited from a common ancestor. Now an interesting thing about homologous features is that they will have the same basic pattern, however they may or may not share the same function, and we'll see this in an example on the next slide. Now on the flip side, our analogous features in the context of anatomy are anatomical features that appear to be similar, however they have evolved via different mechanisms so that they could fulfil a specific purpose and therefore they were not inherited from a common ancestor. And again, we'll look at some examples of this in a minute. And so here we have our example of a homologous feature and they appear somewhat similar in different organisms. 
because they were inherited from a common ancestor. Now, an interesting thing about homologous features is that they will have the same basic pattern, although there may be observational differences on the surface. So here we can see the forelimbs of four different species, all of which look different on the surface and give rise to unique functions based on the environments to which they are adapted. Essentially, they allow a human to hold items, a dog to walk, a bird to fly and a whale to swim. However, looking at the underlying bone structure, we find a similar pattern across the different species, and it is suggestive of a common ancestor when they diverge, allowing each of these species to evolve independently over time. Now, if we turn our attention to our analogous features, they appear similar in different organisms, but not because of a common ancestor. And so the interesting thing about analogous features is that there will be observational similarities. However, they will have evolved separately due to similar selection pressures rather than a common ancestor. So here we can see the wing of two different species, our birds and our bats. And in both instances, the wing provides the organism with flight. However, there are some major differences in anatomical layout, as well as the fact birds have feathered wings, whereas bats do not. Essentially, these differences suggest these two types of wings were not inherited from a common ancestor and evolved independently as flight provided some form of selective advantage. Now, our next piece of evidence, and arguably one of the most revolutionary, is based on molecular biology and the genes encoded within an organism's genetic code. You see, every organism's genome is comprised of the same building blocks, which undergoes the same biological processes of transcription and translation, creating proteins with some sort of biological function. Now, essentially, just like we saw with our anatomical homologies, there can be homologous genetic information resulting in similar genetic code or similar molecular features that suggest a common ancestor and species relatedness. Moving on, our fourth piece of evidence revolves around the field of biogeography, which is where we study the distribution of organisms and fossils globally. Now, this distribution is affected by a number of processes, but on the scale of species evolution, it usually involves the process of continental drift, which is a geographical process whereby the different landmasses on Earth once formed a single continent known as Pangaea. Then around 250 million years ago, it started to separate into multiple smaller continents, which eventually drifted apart and formed the continents that we know and see today. We can then use this information to identify where we might find certain fossils, thereby linking two geographically separated species to a point in time where they were perhaps not geographically separated. And there are a number of fossil records which show this. So here we can see part of our original content of Pangaea. In fact, it's actually Gondwana, which is the southern part of Pangaea. But essentially, many millions of years ago, when these land masses were in close proximity to one another, there were sections where different animals could cross from one landmass to another. Over time, creatures died and their remains were fossilised. And it's the geographical locations of the fossils which are interesting. So, Cynognathus species was essentially a large wolf-like mammal and fossils of this were found in regions that stretched across both South America and Africa. Lystrosaurus species was a reptile with similarities to a pig and fossils of this were found in regions of Africa, India and Antarctica. Glossoptera species were actually woody seed-bearing trees with fossilised remains found across South America, Africa, Antarctica and Australia. And finally, Mesosaurus species were similar to crocodiles and fossils for these were found in South America and Africa. So why is this important? Well, it's extremely unlikely that the exact same fossils and therefore the exact same species would have evolved independently on each of these continents. The only reasonable hypothesis for this distribution is that the continents were at one point connected and as they separated, independent evolution took place. 
And our final piece of evidence is based on our own observations. And it's as simple as that. We view evolution occurring in real time. And there are some small scale evolution experiments that we can do using organisms with very short life cycles to observe the microevolution process as it happens. And for this, we'll look at a range of different examples where we have directly witnessed evolution in action, starting with guppies. Now guppies are small fish that contain a number of different spots on their surface which are controlled at a genetic level. Now typically speaking, over time and through the process of microevolution, male guppies can alter the number of spots they present. Now why might they do this? Well there are two factors. The first is that the male guppies can use spots as a way of attracting females and therefore increasing the mating rate. The second is that male guppies blend into their environment, allowing some form of protection from predators. Now a man called John Endler performed some microevolution experiments utilising a form of artificial selection in order to manipulate the number of spots on male guppies. And so if we look at one of his experiments, he essentially built several artificial ponds. And in each pond, there were a number of guppies with zero predators. Now at the start of the experiment, the average number of spots per male was around 10, and he left the guppies to their own devices for around 6 months. Now over this time period, there were numerous rounds of reproduction and the average number of spots per fish increased from 10 to 11.8. Now at this point in time, he split the populations into 3 different groups. The first group was allowed to continue under the same conditions without the presence of a predator. By the 20 month mark, the average number of spots per fish increased from 11.8 to 13. And the reason for this is that in the absence of a predator, the more attractive males with the most spots fathered more offspring. And because spots are under genetic control, the offspring would have more spots. The second group had Rivulus hearty added, which is a predatory fish but does not directly prey on guppies. In this instance, much like was observed for the group that had no predator added, the number of spots per fish increased from 11.8 to 13, and again, this was due to the more attractive males with the most spots, fathering more offspring. Now, the final group had Cronichla alta added, which is a voracious predator of guppies. Now, in the presence of this predator, the number of spots per fish decreased from 11.8 to 9.5. And this is a direct response as guppies undergo natural selection and microevolution, reducing the number of spots in response to the presence of a predator. Our second example of observable microevolution is in the development of antibiotic resistance since the introduction of antibiotics in the 1940s and the speed at which the bacteria are developing resistance today suggests antibiotic resistant infections will be the biggest cause of deaths by 2050. And we can do various experiments to observe the emergence of antibiotic resistance which is essentially microevolution by natural selection. By treating bacterial populations with sub-inhibitory concentrations of antibiotics we can induce resistance. Now the antibiotics will kill some of the population, however there might be a subpopulation that can grow in the presence of the antibiotic, possibly due to some form of mutation. And because they are the only surviving subpopulation following treatment, they will grow to be the dominant population. And essentially this relates to the founder's effect. Our third example of observable microevolution is in a cooling lake next to a nylon factory in Japan in the 1970s. Now nylon is a synthetic polymer that was invented in the 1930s and therefore no organism on earth had ever encountered it. However, a factory producing nylon was dumping fabric waste into a lake and subsequently it was found that some bacterial species known as flavor bacterium were able to degrade and metabolize certain byproducts of nylon synthesis. Now it is believed that a mutation in one of the bacteria's pre-existing genes produced a new or modified enzyme that could degrade nylon byproducts. 
Now with continuous exposure to the nylon byproducts, a selection pressure was applied to the population and those that had the enzyme survived with the enzyme's efficacy improving over time as it degraded more and more nylon. And that wraps up our different evidence types for evolution. However, to end this video, I want to quickly talk about what we call the post-genomic error. In the time since we sequenced the first human genome, we have made significant strides in our knowledge and understanding of genetic information, shifting from simply identification of genes to understanding how they function and interact with one another as part of a complex biological system. And it's hard to imagine, but when we first set out to sequence the human genome, which was just a single genome, it was a massive undertaking, spanning from the 1990s all the way up to the early 2000s. And this was revolutionary. However, scientists were not content with this and sought to further this research starting the 1000 Genome Project, which aimed to catalogue the depth of human genetic variation. Now, unlike the initial Human Genome Project, which took around 13 years, our development of new technologies allowed a thousand genomes to be sequenced in around four years. Finally, more recently, we started the 100,000 Genome Project, which aimed to look at the genomes of NHS patients with rare diseases, their families, as well as those with common forms of cancer. Now, this was an extremely ambitious project, However, advancements in technology and our understanding of genomics, it was completed in 2019, having taken around six years, which is a remarkable achievement. And essentially, that is where we are today. We are continually pushing the boundaries of our knowledge and technologies in order to understand our genome. Now a cornerstone to this research is the use of bioinformatics, which is a sort of interdisciplinary field that combines biology, computer science, maths and statistics in order to analyse and interpret complex biological data, and this has propelled the field of genomic research in areas such as comparative genomics, disease outbreaks and forensics. And so bioinformatics has been essential in the field of comparative genomics as it has allowed us to effectively and precisely compare the genome of different species, allowing us to identify functional and non-functional sections of the genome. But more importantly, it has allowed both the differences and similarities to be identified, helping us to determine the relatedness of two species. And essentially this provides an extremely accurate way of backing up the other forms of data we have on species relatedness, such as our fossil records, adding to that growing wealth of information and backing up other forms of evidence to provide a robust, all-round picture of how species have evolved over time. Now, the field of bioinformatics can also be extremely useful when it comes to understanding, managing and mitigating disease outbreaks. It allows us to quickly sequence the genome of the infective pathogen, helping to understand its origin, its evolution, and its unique set of virulence or transmissibility genes. But I guess more importantly, by sequencing multiple patients associated with the disease, we can build up a phylogenetic tree of the outbreak, allowing us to track the spread of disease over time or in different locations, identifying different possible transmission routes. So I guess some key examples of this are the tracking of the Ebola virus between 2014 and 2016 in Western Africa, and we were able to use phylogenetic analysis to work backwards and estimate the timing of the first zoonotic transmission event into humans that started the epidemic. Looking a little more closer to home, we use bioinformatics, albeit a less powerful version than what we have today, to track the 2005 outbreak of E. coli 0157H7 in South Wales. Over 150 people were infected with this particular strain of bacteria, resulting in the death of a young boy. But we were able to track the outbreak to the disease back to a contaminated food served by a local butcher. Finally, and more recently, we've used bioinformatics to track and monitor the SARS coronavirus 2 virus, which is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, allowing different strains to be identified and the spread of these strains globally to be monitored. 
and we are slowly starting to use our understanding of the disease and our bioinformatics tools to investigate the different effect this virus has on our own bodies and our own genomes, looking at how we respond to different strains and variations of the virus. Now finally, in the field of forensics, the use of genomic data has been game-changing in terms of convicting criminals of crimes they have committed by proving the origin of various specimens. And a well-known and studied example of this is Juan Meso, a Spanish anaesthetist who was responsible for one of the largest medical-related outbreaks of hepatitis C in history. Essentially, between 1988 and 1997, he infected around 275 patients with hepatitis C as he reused contaminated medical equipment without proper sterilization. Now he was caught as it was noted the instance rate of hepatitis C cases in the Valencia hospital where he worked were unusually high. This led to epidemiological and evolutionary analysis of the hepatitis C virus in each of the infected patients allowing a phylogenetic tree to be created and evolutionary links between infected patients and a control to be studied. And it was found the high degree of similarity between the strains infecting each of the patients suggested a common source of infection, with the anaesthetist being the culprit, as it was found all of the patient's strains of the hepatitis C virus were derivatives of his own landing him with a 1,933-year prison sentence for his crimes. And essentially, those are just a few ways in which we are using bioinformatics and our understanding of genomics to help benefit humanity. And with that, we come to the end of this video. Hopefully, you found the content useful, informative, and most importantly, easy to understand. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.